Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwined through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Welcome back to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where once again, I am very perplexed. One of the original ideas I I got when I began studying Torah was that I'm not a body. I am a soul in a body. Just like the way that when I'm driving my car, I don't identify as a black four-door sedan. I just recognize that that is a vehicle that gets me from point A to point B. And likewise, the way I should look at my body, it it is a vehicle for me to get around in this world. But it gives me that dynamic of free will so I can have the challenge and the opportunity to do mitzvot and to recognize God. But what got confusing for me the other day was I was contemplating the mode ani, where it says that you're thanking God for returning your soul to me. And it got me thinking. If I'm thanking God for returning my soul to me, then with that statement, I'm saying that the me is the body. And that's contradictory to what the way I always view this. And then on the other side of the equation, I understand that when I die, that my soul goes and does an accounting in front of the heavenly tribunal, in front of the almighty. And my body, which has a finite shelf life, is down there disintegrating in the ground. And now it appears that the me is my soul. So what is it? I'm confused. You know, today is actually my birthday. I'm now 51. I always sort of heard that when men get into their their middle age years, they begin to have a crisis of identity. And I am certainly having one. What is the me? Who is me? Is it a soul? Is it a body? What is it? So I asked my dear friend, Rabbi Busco, to come on the show and answer this question for me. So how are you, Rabbi Busco? Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for having me again on your podcast. I always enjoy having you on here. I need a big thank you to help me address this question. I'm having an identity crisis. I hope you can answer it for me. So what am I? Am I a body or am I a soul? Great. It's an excellent question. I hope I can help you uh, and everyone else that's listening. This is a very fundamental concept that needs to be addressed by everyone. It's so fundamental to the core of our being. Who, Who is the real me? Who am I? This is a question that's been pondered not just in Jewish thought, but this is something that philosophers have addressed throughout all of history. And it is a bit strange. We do find contradictions the way you're pointing out. We are constantly taught in Judaism that we are not our bodies. Our body just comes from dirt and God blew a soul into man. And and that's the thinking being within us. And yet, as you pointed out, we find in liturgy, Modani is just one place. We find other places in, in the blessing of Elokai Neshama that we also say in the morning where we refer to God as returning my soul to me, giving me a soul, which seems to imply that I'm not my soul. The way you set it up sounds like there's only two options. Either I am a body or I am a soul. And therefore, if we're speaking from the point of view of me and referring to the soul as something external that seems to imply that I am a body, that's not necessarily the case. And well, in fact, it's not the case. The truth is that we are, when it comes to a body and a soul, we're neither, and we're both. And we'll have to explain more, obviously, what that means. But before we get into what is the true identity of the self, it's helpful, I believe, to understand what is the makeup of the body and makeup of the soul and how they interact with each other to, sh- to show that really they're, they're not so different. Well, it's kind of funny because they, they are extremely different, and yet they're, they're very much the same. Let's get into it. The body and the soul, we are taught, come from extremely opposite realms. The beginning of all of creation starts with Hashem, the infinite creator, the source of all being. And from there, there is a sort of chain of reality that extends downward of things of, let's say, condensed light. If you want to be very Kabbalistic about it in a more accessible language, maybe we could say becoming more and more physical and less spiritual as it progresses downward. In the higher realms above our world, we have angels and we have all sorts of worlds above those with with different classes of angels and it goes all the way up to what we refer to as the throne of glory which is basically the just the point where reality as we know it can be defined 
And above that is just, well, from our perspective, nothingness, but God in a, in an undefined way at the very top of that creation at the very top, as close to Hashem as you could possibly go without just being absorbed into the infinite at that place is where the human soul comes from. That is the, what we call the neshama. And it has the capacity to reach every aspect of all of creation. It was designed in a way that it maps out and corresponds to every aspect of creation so that if it would be activated, it could affect any particular world or realm or spiritual dimension that may exist in all of creation. It was designed like that for a purpose, which we'll explain in just a second. But what the human being is when we're created is that neshama, that soul gets dragged down from the highest point of creation possible down to the lowest point of creation possible, which is the physical world, the, the farthest from the source of spirituality there could possibly be. In this realm, in this world, it's so distant from God that it's possible to even deny God's existence, which is obvious to you and me walking around and, and you and I both didn't grow up religious. And so it's, it's very reasonable to, to not believe in God. But coming from the perspective of all of reality is a creation of God and God is all that exists, it would seem unfathomable to even think that there is no such thing as God or to not deny God's existence. But that's how far down we are in this world, so distant from reality, so immersed in the illusion of this physical world, it's the farthest place we could possibly be. And that's where the body comes from. The body comes from earth itself. It's made from physical material. And so what God did was combine the soul, which comes from the highest possible place, with the body, which comes from the lowest possible place in creation, and merged them together. We're taught in Torah sources that this is very distressing for the soul. It's very uncomfortable for such a lofty spiritual entity to be locked into this low form of, of reality, which is so distant from God. It's very unpleasant, to say the least. And what our job is, is as the combination of these two creatures, these two entities, the neshama and the body, the neshama was built with the capacity to affect all of the realms in creation, but it doesn't have the tools to bring that effect into action. All the way at the top where it exists, it can't do anything. It just exists as a spiritual entity but it doesn't have any power to cause an effect. And therefore, when it's brought down and merged with a body that spans all of those worlds, then through the actions of the body, through this, this interface, this uh, call it the matrix, using the avatar of the body, it's able to act and do things. And those things, when they have moral implications, ethical implications, that will affect different worlds and, and all the things that the neshama intends to affect. But it's only possible when the two of them are joined together. And what I mentioned earlier when I said that the, the neshama and the body, even though they're the most opposite beings that could possibly exist, they're actually quite the same, is that the body was designed to fit the soul. So even though they, they come from the most opposite places possible, they were built for each other. The body is mapped out in a way that corresponds to the makeup of the soul. And in fact, in Kabbalistic literature, we find that if you want to understand anything that's internal, you first look at the external, because the external is only a reflection of the internal or a manifestation of the internal. You want to understand deep things, you first look on the outside, and that gives you the insight to the inside. King David said this in Psalms when he said, from my flesh, I will see you. And so from there, we, we have a lot of Kabbalistic information that comes from analyzing the structure of the body. And in fact, we know a lot about the structure of the universe and, and, and all of creation from how the body is structured, and we speak in those terms as well. So we find that the body and the soul are both mapped out very specifically to match not with just with each other, but also to match with reality, with all of creation, in order that it can affect all of creation. Now, what's the purpose for all this? Why is it designed to affect all of creation? That's in order to bring divinity, to bring godliness into this world and all of the worlds to unite God's existence. We said that this world is so far from the source of reality, so far from God that it's just this big illusion. It's even possible to deny God. Well, our job is to reveal God's presence in this world, which is the farthest possible place, and to unify God's quote unquote name 
uh, in all layers of these realities. So in a nutshell, that's the purpose of man. That's from a Jewish perspective uh, what the body and the soul are and what our job is in this. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about in that issue, but this was just sort of a preface to get to understanding what the self is. Can you clarify what you mean or, or can you give an example of how the body is provides an example of how do you phrase that? The body is an example of what is happening at a spiritual level. I mean, how, how we can see the structure of reality from the body? Yes. For example, the way we can see the structure of reality from the body is the, f the first thing that exists in the human being looking from the top down, the top being the source of creation going down is we see the top of the head, which contains the brain and all of the cognitive functions. This is the source of our thoughts, the source of our wills and desires. It begins there. That's the source of creation, the, the thought to begin the whole process. As we go down through the, through the head, we find different faculties like sight and hearing and speech, which really originates in the throats. And all of these things, I, I don't want to get too detailed into the, uh, into the implications of, of these different different faculties, we could maybe do it another time. It would be a very interesting subject to explore. But each of these in descending order plays a role in, in creation as we get down to the neck, which is the, the connecting point between the head and the body, meaning the intellectual and the action. We find that, that transition source where it goes from the theoretical into the practical. And finally, we get down into the arms where, where action takes place. So that, that's just a, a very superficial overview of, of how we can find that structure. With that foundation of understanding what the body is, what the soul is, what their purpose is together, now we can come to understand what the self is. And I mentioned before that we're both the body and the soul, and we're also neither. And an analogy I like to give to explain this is water. I find this to be a, a very helpful analogy. Water is made up, it's a chemical compound, it's made up of two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. So would you say that water is hydrogen or oxygen? Well, it's neither, and it's, and it's both. And, and it's also not just throwing a bunch of hydrogen and oxygen into a room. If you would release a bunch of hydrogen gas into the room and you would release oxygen into the room, you wouldn't find water there either. It's, it's a very specific combination of how these atoms interact with each other, which creates this compound, this new entity called water, which has very unique properties. And really, this analogy could work with any chemical compound, but water is very relatable. So in a very similar way, we're not the body, we're not the soul. We are the result of the combination of the body and the soul. And I'll explain a little bit more with that. There's a story in the Talmud which relates a parable which relates that there were there were two men who attempted to steal from the orchard of a king. One man was blind and the other one was lame. And the lame man had a problem. He wasn't able to walk through the orchard to be able to collect the fruits that he wanted. He could see everything there in front of him. He knew exactly where to go, but he wasn't able to walk into the orchard and take them. Whereas the blind man had the opposite problem. The blind man had all of the capacity to walk through the orchard and take the fruits that he wanted, but he had no idea where to go. He was unable to navigate. And they had an idea. They joined forces together. And the blind man put the lame man on top of his shoulders. The lame man was able to provide direction for the blind man. And together they walked through the orchard and collected all of the fruits. Later, the king was incensed. He found that these two men had stole from him and wanted to mete out some punishment. So first he went to the lame man and he confronted him. And he said, I have proof. I know that you stole from my orchard. It's time for your punishment. And the layman argued, you can't punish me. The king said, why not? The layman said, well, you can't punish me because I couldn't possibly have done it on my own. It's, it's, if it were just me involved, nothing could have happened because look at me. I'm lame. I have no ability to go anywhere. All I can do is see the fruits. So it's clearly not my fault that your fruits got stolen. Fine. The king accepted that answer and he went to the blind man and the blind man said the opposite claim. The blind man says, look, I, I wouldn't be able to possibly see which fruits to take. Uh, if not for the layman, you should punish the layman instead of me. Upon hearing both of these arguments, the king didn't know what to do, so he thought for a moment, and he said, I got it. Put the layman on top of the blind man's shoulders, and he beat them together. That's the end of the story in the, in the Talmud. What we're trying to learn from that is to understand that, well, it's really focusing on the negative. If we do sins in this world, how could we be held accountable for our misdeeds in this world? Because 
the body itself, even though it has the ability to traverse through the physical world, it's completely inanimate without the soul. It's just a lump of, of flesh. And so therefore, the body's claim is you, you couldn't get any physical punishment for, for these spiritual deeds because it was, it was only the spirit that animated the body to commit any wrongdoing. And the spirit, the soul, has the opposite claim that it's true it was the animating force, but without the body, it wouldn't be able to actually do anything. And so therefore, the Talmud is informing us that the only way we could possibly be punished for our misdeeds is if that combination is recreated and the body rejoins with the soul again and we receive what is due. That tells us how we can get punishments, but what's really more telling about that is any sort of judgment or punishment that's brought upon a person needs to be because that individual is held accountable. Now, what we see is that the body alone isn't held accountable and the soul alone isn't held accountable. So what that tells us is who was the one that committed the misdeed? Who was the one that committed the act? It wasn't the body and it wasn't the soul, right? It was the combination of the two of them together. And that creates the identity of the self. So I'm both. I'm a, I'm a soul and I'm a body. Fair enough. And I do understand the, the concept here too is that is only through this construct that we could interact with this world. But again, my body has a very finite shelf life. Eventually it's going to be buried in the ground. And then my body's not going to come with me to the heavens to give an accounting of our life. It's just going to be that one aspect of myself, the me, which you said I am both, but now my, my soul is isolated and giving uh, an accounting of what both the soul and the body did. So reconcile that for me. So now we're getting into the topic of the resurrection of the dead, which is a, a very prevalent Torah concept. If you don't mind, though, I'd like to leave that a little bit for later because I don't think that we fully grasped what the idea of the self is. We did find that the self can only exist with the combination of the body and the soul, but the exact nature of that identity, what it is, still needs a little bit more exploration. And so for this, we can go to another piece of Talmud that we find in the Tractate of Brachos, Brachot, that says that everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. A famous commentator, Rashi, explains on that, on that piece of Talmud that when a person is about to be born, coming into the world, his soul is about to enter the body, God decides if this person will be tall or short, handsome or not, wealthy, poor, uh, intelligent, everything, Rashi says, everything that pertains to that person is predetermined for him by God, except whether or not he will be righteous or wicked. And his ability to choose, to make moral decisions, is the only thing he has autonomy over. We can try as hard as we can to be wealthy or to make ourselves beautiful, whatever it is, these things are preordained for us. The only thing that's significant, the only reason we're in this world is to make moral decisions. And that's called our free will. That does answer another question I had, which is if God gave me my body, if God gave me my intellect, if God apparently gives me my ideas, he coordinates who I interact with and the people in my life. It does also beg the question, then what is mine? Where do I play a part in this if he's coordinating everything? And it, and it sounds like really when it comes down to it, what you're clarifying for me is that our essence is nothing more than that free will decision to choose to acknowledge God and submit our will to God or to do the other. Is that accurate? A hundred percent right. And in order to consolidate these two ideas that we mentioned earlier, that right, the this idea now that our entire self, our autonomy is our free will decision and the idea that we are the combination of the body and the soul. These two ideas are much more connected than, than just our ability to make good decisions. But really what, what our moral decisions are, what our free will decisions are, is the decision to identify with our soul that we have or to identify with our body. Which do we determine to be primary? That is really the nature of our, of, of all free will decisions. We are taught that we have two opposing forces that are always acting within us constantly. There's this battle that's raging inside of us, even though we're not aware of it at all times. We have what's called a Yetzer Tov and a Yetzer Hara, inclination to do good and inclination to do evil. 
And the nature of the inclination to do good is simply the soul that we have. This soul, this neshama, which comes from the highest realms, it's magnetically drawn toward its source, which is in the lofty places, toward Hashem. It longs to do the right thing, quote unquote, the right thing, right? To, to unify with God, to be a spiritual entity, to be a giver as opposed to a taker, to emulate God. That's this natural drive that exists within us by nature of the fact that we are comprised of a soul. On the other hand, we have what's called the Yitzhahara, which is the inclination to do evil, which is not necessarily just the body. The body doesn't have any natural drive other than to just be a rock, which does account for things like laziness. Everything longs to go back to its source. So the soul wants to go up into the heavens. The body wants to just sleep, curl up in the sun like a dog, and stay there forever. What the evil inclination is, is if it would only be a choice between those two, between the soul's immense drive toward God and just the body wanting to stay at rest because of Newton's first, Newton's first law, there would be no question. There would be no challenge. We would instantaneously choose every option that will bring us toward divinity. And so therefore, God created a new entity called Ra in Hebrew, which is evil. It's a drive that pushes us in the opposite direction. It's our trainer our boxing trainer that, that pushes us down, that tries to kill us, but it's created for our own good. It's what allows us to make these decisions. Because if we would be drawn toward any one side naturally, let's say if the strength of the soul would overpower the drive to stay in bed and sleep, for example. So then my decision to get up and pray or to get up and do something righteous wouldn't be attributed to me. It would be attributed to the overpowering nature of the soul that drove me to do it. In order for me to have autonomy, in order for me to have a true free will decision, there needs to be equal tension. And these choices don't come about every day. They Sometimes they're few and far between. The truth is the more we exercise our ability to make these decisions, the more opportunities we'll have to, to find them. But these are the two forces that exist within us we have our natural soul, which drives towards God, and we have an external entity which has been ingested through the sin of Adam when he, in, when he ate from that tree. He ingested this drive toward anti-spirituality. And therefore, we find ourselves at a battle line. So now that we have this equal tension and we have this ability to choose, to choose between our spirituality and our animalistic, earthly, physical nature— that choice really comes down to, am I going to identify with my soul anytime I do something righteous? What I'm really doing is I'm giving credence to my soul. I'm allowing my soul to be primary. I'm allowing my soul to be the decision maker. And that becomes my identity. Whatever I choose is me. Whatever I want, that's who I am. So if I choose what my soul wants, what I'm really doing is I'm identifying with my soul as opposed to my body. And the, the same is true, unfortunately, on the other side. If I choose to stay in bed or if I choose to engage in things which are purely physical and purely uh, the drives of my animalistic nature, then I am choosing to ignore my, my spiritual nature and identify with the body. Now, the unfortunate truth is that after this ingestion of the this evil nature, this yetzahara, this inclination toward anti-spirituality, we actually have an uphill battle to face. There's a slightly unfair advantage on the side of the, let's call it the body side, which makes it by default, if we don't try, we will naturally identify with the body and lose connection with our souls. So that's something we have to be aware of, that it requires constant effort and constant vigilance on the battlefield. All our sensory perception is just tied into this world. None of it's tied into the spiritual world. It does seem like an unfair advantage. However, it does make sense that if, if God created our neshama from such a lofty place, that if it didn't have some counterforce, then there would be nothing to earn. It also seems, too, that when you look at a lot of the mitzvot, they're very physical in nature. Like my body never realized before I became religious and learned what to fill and work, never was saying, I, I really wish I could tie a leather box onto my arm and head. The neshama has to basically convince the body, this is in your best interest, do this. 
Same with eating. The body wants to eat, but to stop and say a broccoli before you eat and after you eat. That's sort of the, the, the soul stepping in, intervening and saying, you can have this, but you also have to do this for me. Is It seems like all this is sort of plays into this, this relationship. It's a great point you're bringing up. It, we need to address that because there are many spiritual traditions which the idea is if you want to become more spiritual and less physical, you abandon physicality. We find that monks go in and fast on mountaintops and, and are ascetic and um, practice abstinence and things like that to avoid physicality and really truly identify with their spiritual nature. Now, in Judaism, that is a stepping stone on the path towards ultimate spirituality. It's called precious abstinence, but it's not the end goal. The end goal is, like we mentioned earlier, that the soul and the body need to work in tandem. They need to work, they're mapped out for each other. The soul is only effective when it has a body to be able to traverse through the world and do good things. We spoke about that example in the Talmud of, of the lame man and the blind man, and that was from the negative perspective of, of misdeeds. But the same is true on the other side, of course, that we're only able to truly create and do godly things in this world because of the body's involvement, because we're able to span all of these realms and go all the way to the bottom. And therefore, the ideal situation is not to completely abandon the body and be and be a soul. The ideal scenario, the, the ideal relationship is that the soul is completely primary and has the control and the body is only a vehicle for the soul. But they're both needed. They're both necessary. And I think this might be a good time to address what you mentioned earlier with the resurrection of the dead. There is a lot of confusion about this, and, and there's a lot of still unknown, obviously, about what exactly it's like when someone dies, what happens. In a nutshell, this is what we're taught from Kabbalistic teachings. When the soul and the body separate at death, now this is going to be different for every individual, and it's very complicated to the degree to which a person has purified himself and identified with his spiritual nature. First of all, the, the process of death itself is very different. For someone who has elevated their consciousness regularly throughout their life and identified as a soul, not just making good free will decisions, but like I mentioned, elevating their consciousness to become aware of a reality which, which transcends physicality, for that person, the transition into death is very smooth. The Talmud says like, like taking a hair out of milk. However, on the other hand, someone that spent their lives completely immersed in physicality and totally oblivious to their spiritual nature, the process of death is, is very painful and difficult, like dragging a thorn through wool. So that's the process of death itself. And then afterwards, there needs to be a time of healing where the soul can acclimate to its new environment where it came before, and the body needs to decompose, which is a rectification for the body itself. When the body and soul separate and they each have their time to recuperate and go through whatever process they need in order to heal from any damage that was done in this world, which is almost inevitable, then they will be able to be rejoined, connected together again, so that we can achieve the true goal of our creation, which is, like we just said, for the soul to be totally primary, the body to be secondary. In this life, it's impossible to have that completely because the soul is very much locked in by the body and, and we have, as I mentioned, ingested that uh, source of evil itself. It's all part of us. The process of death removes that. And eventually when the soul and body are reconnected, they're reconnected in a way that's in total purity. It's clean. There's no remnants of that evil that's left. And therefore the proper relationship can be achieved where the soul is primary the body is secondary and will almost be an opposite experience that we have now where we walk around so cognizant of our physical nature and we'd have to really focus and, and meditate maybe to perceive our spirituality at all. It'll be the exact opposite in, in the next world after the resurrection that our spiritual nature will be so obvious that we will, we will be that soul and the fact that we have a vehicle which is physical called the body, that would be almost imperceptible. This is an experience that, that no human has, has ever had before and will only occur during that time period. It sounds like Adam had that experience before the ingestion of the evil. Adam's experience was, was very close to this. 
he needed to do one thing. He needed to eat from the correct tree. And instead he sinned. But he, he was very close to this. Unfortunately, I don't have, I'm not an expert in this subject so much, but um, I know that he didn't quite achieve that ultimate relationship between the body and the soul, but it was very similar. It sounds like also that Adam being placed here in this position of being soul first and body second, that there was no real test for him. He was totally tuned in to the Almighty. It, it seemed like that, that level of tension that we have, where we can have those real tests to choose the soul over the body is more challenging. And therefore, every time we make the right decision, we are building something for ourselves. It seemed like Adam didn't really have that originally. And maybe that's what he was going for by eating the tree of knowledge. And maybe that's why he did that. There, it seemed like, you know, it's like with everything, the more effort you put into something, the greater the reward, the more ownership you have to it. And maybe there was some calculated decision on his part to take that for himself. You're right about that. That natural tension that we experience between good and evil, these two voices that exist within our own heads, he didn't have that. The, the drive to do evil did exist, but it was external to him. And therefore, it was a, a completely calculated decision that he made. And there is a very prevalent theory that you're describing right now is that, you know, he was created with all this divine power. He was created with godly power of creation. His soul was, was and body were mapped out to be able to manipulate the entire, not just physical universe, but all realms of creation. And so he's standing around thinking, I was created with this unbelievable power that seems to rival God's, and yet I meant to do nothing with it. What if I lower myself and I ingest evil and then fight back toward God? Then I will have achieved something for God. Then I will, I will truly accomplish the purpose of my existence by being able to utilize that power from the lowest of all places. There is a, a prevalent theory that that was his calculation. We don't have any sort of conception of what was going on in his mind because we're, we're taught from the Talmud that his mind spanned all of reality. We, we just couldn't relate to his thinking at all. But that argument does seem to be at least one theory that I've heard. And when I've read text on how he was able to see from one in the universe, the other, it, it's very similar sounding text to when you read about the baby in utero is able, knows all the Torah is able to see from one in the universe, the other. It's like, it's very similar sounding type ideas of the infant in utero versus Adam before the sin. It is. And we, we need to have that experience because we need to know what's possible. We don't believe that we are a tabula rasa, right? This blank slate that's created from scratch. The beginning of our creation, we experience everything that's possible. We have knowledge of everything that we'll need to know throughout our lives. And the process of our lives is rediscovering all of these truths. Personally, this is, this seems to be the experience when, whenever I, and I imagine other people as well, when you experience, when you hear something true wisdom. When you hear something like that and it, and it clicks with you, I find that the experience isn't learning something new, a new fact, but it's it's recognizing a truth that's so obvious. And it's it's almost like you knew it always, but just weren't so cognizant of it. That is an important aspect of, of our lives. I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, to the, the real crux of our topic, which is the self. We spoke a lot about the theoretical knowledge of who we are, what the self is, the combination of the body and the soul. Maybe we could talk a little bit about some practical ways to actually identify, to get in touch with who we are and to know who we are and, and the self. So in a, in a nutshell, it's the Torah, right? Just doing all the commandments in the Torah, that's the guide. That's how you can truly become yourself. A lot of people, especially people that, that didn't grow up religious, and even many people that did grow up religious that just don't really understand what the Torah is meant to do, what is meant to give them, a lot of people get the feeling that adhering to this system, which is so rigid and so demanding and, and so uniform, that you'll lose your identity in following all of these laws and, and so many people dress the same in these communities. And it's like you just fall into this group mentality and you become a sheep and you're just a follower and you totally lose your identity. The truth is the Torah is a path towards your ultimate individuality. It could be abused and it is. 
it can be used in a way you'll just do it by rote and go through the motions and you live and just doing what everyone else is doing. And unfortunately, that that is a common experience with many religions and Judaism is not an exception, unfortunately. But when it's done correctly, a person can truly discover who he is and express who he is and bring his true potential to fruition. That's the purpose of the entire Torah. More specifically than just adhering to the Torah, we're taught in a Mishnah and a teaching in Pirkei Alvis, the ethics of our fathers, that the world stands on three pillars. And these three pillars are all ways of accessing your true identity. And one of them, I believe, in particular, more than the other two. And these three pillars are, number one, Torah study, loving kindness, and service, which in our generation, that's prayer. Now, Torah study helps us connect with who we are because it gives us the tools uh, in a very superficial way. Now, the truth is Torah study is much more than that. It, it merges your mind, which is the highest function of yourself. It merges your mind with God. But for what we're speaking about right now, it at least provides you with the information and the tools that you can go forward and access your potential. So Torah study is necessary for that. The next one is called chesed in Hebrew, which is translated as loving kindness or just giving. And this might actually seem a bit paradoxical. How do you get to know yourself by giving? It seems like the opposite. But the truth is that when you give to other people, that's also an act of selfishness. But it's an act of healthy selfishness. It's an expanse of selfishness. What I mean by that is anything that we give value to needs to be included within our world, within our perspective, because nothing exists beyond our own perspective. And so when I choose to put myself out for the benefit of someone else, and I do that act of self-sacrifice, what I'm implicitly saying is that this other person, this other entity that's in the world has value and therefore is included within my world as well. What happens then is that my sense of self expands beyond my own person and starts to include other people. And this is how love is born. There's a common misconception that you give things to people that you love, but it's really the opposite. You'll end up loving people that you give to. That's how it starts. The act of extending your resources, and resources doesn't just mean your money, it means your effort, your thought, prayer. If, when you spend time just thinking about someone else and what's good for them, you're using your own personal resources to expand your sense of self to include other people. And that's an act of healthy selfishness because you're growing yourself. Now you become a bigger person and others are included within your sense of self. This is a way to access your sense of self as well. Is this? It's an expansive way. You made me think of something else too, Rabbi, that to bring back to the original point you made that who is the me is defined by the degree in which I choose God. And when you think that that neshama is created by God and is very much like God, well, God is only in a state of giving. So when we allow our neshama to control our body and be also in that state of giving, that's also helping us identify who our true self is, which is a piece of God, which is a soul. Exactly. That's right. So the, the third pillar, uh, which is prayer, you might be surprised to hear that, that I really think that that is the most powerful way to access the sense of self. Now, this might be very surprising to a lot of people who think that what prayer is, is asking God for things. And, and really, that is how it's structured. That's how it's phrased in our liturgy is a series of requests. But it, it's much deeper than that. And there's a reason why it's structured in terms of requests, which uh, if we have enough time, we will get into. But what prayer really is, is it's the act of accessing what we truly want. It's the act of accessing our desire. And there's nothing more you than what you want. In fact, in Hebrew, we have a concept called gematria. And gematria means that each letter in the ancient Hebrew language corresponds to a number. And there's a very interesting code that if a word would have a certain numerical value by adding the sum of its letters, if that would equal another word, then, then there's some connection between these two words. One of these two connections we find is that the word for will or desire is ratzon. Ratzon is the same numerical value as the word makor, which means source. And this is actually intuitive if we think about it. The, the, the source of anything is it begins with a will. Well, let's talk about this right now. When I decide to open my mouth to speak, so what made 
my jaw twitch or my my bone move. But what made my bone move? Because the muscles moved it. Because a nerve initiated that muscle's movement and because a neuron fired in my brain to make that nerve twitch. What made that first neuron fire? Right. And and I don't I don't know if you would ask a scientist will they have an answer for you? I'm not sure. I, I don't think there's an answer for this that that the, exists in the uh, in the scientific world, but that's what it is. Will it's beyond anything that we can define in this world. It's it's above all of that will and desire, which transcends even thought, is the source of all of it. It's it's what has no source of its own. So will your will, what you truly want, what you truly desire, that's the source of who you are. Like we said before, if any, if any action you do can be attributed to your genetics or uh, the way you grew up or anything like that, that's not really you because it's just a product of your environment or whatever it is. What's truly you, as we mentioned before, is your ability to make free will decisions. And the key word there, obviously, is will. Your desire. What do you want? What you want is who you really are. And so, therefore, the service of prayer is it can and should be a very profound spiritual discipline. A person should really be in the right state of mind. We're, we're, we're taught all of this in the Talmud. It's a great shame to just walk into prayer services and, and mumble through all the words, even if you're paying attention to what you're saying. It's a tremendous experience to get into what's really a meditative state and access what you truly desire, what you truly will. And the reason it's a service and the reason why it's formatted in terms of uh, requests from God is we're trying to access our will and direct our will toward the things which we know sh really should be good for us. When I'm asking God for health, for example, I'm doing two things simultaneously. I'm one, acknowledging that God is the source of my health, which is a whole other dimension of prayer we haven't spoken about. But number two, which is more relevant to this discussion, is I am stating implicitly that that's what I want. If I'm asking for it, obviously, it's because I want it. And it's the act of morphing our will to want the things that are good for us. And that can truly build us as individuals. When we tap into our rotson, we tap into our will, we tap into our desires, and we are able to lift them up and decide that we want higher things for ourselves. Because unfortunately, if we, if we look at what we really want, it's pretty pathetic. You know, if we would really be honest with ourselves and not an answer that we would give on a survey, but if you would be brave enough to really look into your heart and, and what you really desire, I think most of us, unfortunately, wouldn't be so proud of our true desires. Now, so, some of them, yes, and some of them not. But what the work of prayer is, is uplifting all of those, is accessing that will and transforming it higher. In order to illustrate that idea with prayer, maybe I could tell you a little bit of a Torah idea. Our patriarch Isaac and his wife, our matriarch Rebecca, they were married for many years without children. And they each prayed daily, many times for, for hours, asking for a child, beseeching God for a child. And we're taught that it is the prayer of Isaac that was answered and not the prayer of Rebecca. And our sages inform us that you can't compare the prayer of a righteous person, a tzaddik, who is the son of a tzaddik, to the prayer of a tzaddik, a righteous person, who is the child of a wicked person. Okay, so let me repeat that. There's something called a tzaddik ben tzaddik, which is the righteous person who is the child of another righteous person. And there's a tzaddik ben rasha, a righteous person who's the child of a wicked person. So Isaac, whose father was Abraham, they were both righteous in his family. Everyone was, uh, they were very pious people. But Rebecca's father was was quite wicked. She herself took a different path and became righteous, but she, let's say she came from different stock. And that's the reasoning that's given to us why Isaac's prayer was chosen over Rebecca's in order to be, to, to be accepted and answered is that he was a righteous person, the son of a righteous person, and she wasn't. And a lot of people are bothered by this idea because it seems to a lot of people like it should be the opposite. Isaac, who it was very natural for him to pray and didn't face a lot of challenges to to overcome in that realm, at least to, to decide to pray to God, he was raised in this way. You might think that his prayer would be less valuable than someone who had chosen their path on their own, which is very significant, had used their free will to overcome the, the upbringing they were given 
and to choose God's path and, and to pray to God despite their upbringing. And there are many different answers to this, why despite that Isaac's prayer was still answered. But one that I connected to a lot and one that really brings out this idea that that's relevant to our topic is that it's true that in terms of reward, Rebecca was rewarded more for her prayer. It required more effort, more humility on her part to overcome her background and, and to pray to God. So in terms of the spiritual reward for engaging in the act of prayer, it's true. Hers was considered more, let's say, valuable, whatever you want to say. But nevertheless, it didn't have the same objective power, the same spiritual power as Isaac's prayer. And the reason that's given for this approach is we have a verse in Psalms where King David says, that I am my prayer to you. And so the, the idea is that that's taken very literally. I am my prayer. And so while it's true that Rebecca had a lot to overcome, and she did, and she chose the correct path, but nevertheless, she, she isn't completely pure because there will always remain aspects of a person that, that linger from their past, even if they've chosen a correct path. Um, it's almost inevitable. Whereas Isaac, from his birth, whether or not he had to work for it, the fact remains is that he is a pure spiritual being. And when it comes to the effectiveness of prayer, what prayer is, is it's an expression of who you are, which is what we were saying earlier. King David said, I am my prayer to you. It's an expression of your ultimate will, your purest ratzon, your desire. And therefore, Isaac's was much more powerful and, and much more potent because it was a purer expression of spirituality. Okay, so that makes sense. That adds some more color to the my question on who am I? Who is the me? And you have helped me understand that it is both a body and a soul, but what it really comes down to is what defines the me is what I desire. And that is expressed in my prayer. That's right. And I'd like to add just one more thing, uh, especially people in my generation. I'm, I'm only 30 years old and, uh, and I imagine people younger than me as well. There seems to have been much more of a trend in my generation and the younger generations of having a low self-esteem and sometimes depression. There's a lot of people on antidepressants throughout the country. And a lot of it has to do with having a lack of identity, a lack of sense of self. People feel empty inside. And the advice that I heard a lot growing up and what I would see on TV for kids and things like that was, you know, you have to discover who you are. And that was often accompanied by images of a guitar or hockey skates and things like that, meaning you find a hobby that you enjoy and that will be an expression of you or like you wear clothes that express your personality and, and that's you. And that's very sad because that's very superficial. I'm not saying that that has nothing to do with your identity. It does to a certain degree. But if you can define who you are by your hobbies, that's a very shallow person indeed. And what, we, what we've explained up until now is that the true self, the true sense of self comes from the enactment of the will that needs to be built. There is an aspect that you need to discover. There is a natural set of abilities that you've been created with. There is a natural tendency towards certain spiritual paths than others, that there is a process of exploration and discovery of what your natural focus is. But what's much more significant is the work that you put into yourself to actually develop and build your sense of identity. That can only happen if you choose to do it. Right. As we said that your identity is the result of your free will choice. It's your autonomy. So that means that you need to do it for a lot of people that don't have a sense of self. It's not because necessarily they don't know who they are. It's because there's no one there, which is, which is quite frightening, but we have the ability. What it's, it's frightening on one hand, but on the other hand, it's very exciting and it's very empowering that we have the ability to create and define ourselves. And that comes when we have a, we have a moral compass. We have a set of values that we that we understand intellectually that we need to live by in order to progress and develop ourselves. Every time we act with integrity and we put those principles into action in the real world, we are reinforcing our sense of identity 
And that is what gives a person that confidence. That's what gives that person a sense of self and fulfillment in their life. And that's what we need to be working toward. I was just thinking as, as you were talking about in choosing God is recognizing that our talents are, are gifts from God so that we don't become arrogant because of whatever natural given talents we may have. But then our identity comes from what we desire to use those talents to do. Does that make sense? Of course. Right. We all need, we all need a higher purpose to, to live towards. And essential that we identify that as soon as possible. I was reading something the other day about Rabbi Shimon ben Yarkai. I think it was his son. He had the very first liposuction surgery. And the reason was not because he was planning a beach vacation and wanted to look ripped in his bathing suit. It's because he wanted to pull out his some fat and then set it out and see if the maggots and worms ate it. Because apparently if you are successful at that high level where you elevate the body, your body doesn't decompose when you die, apparently. It remains intact in the ground. That's right. The example that you chose is a little bit of a different idea. He had done something which was, which was really unthinkable in his time, which he gave over a Jewish person to the Roman government to be executed, which is considered high treason in Jewish law. I mean, even if a person is, a, is causing problems, you don't do that. And he justified it because he intuited that the person deserved to die. And people did not believe that. And he was challenged. And so in order to prove to himself also that it was true, he wanted to, because he said that it came from his gut. He had a gut feeling. And so what he did, he cut out a piece of his gut and put it out and he saw that it didn't rot. And so he saw that it was pure. There have been reports of people digging up righteous people that have been buried for, for many decades, sometimes over a hundred years and no decomposition whatsoever. In fact, they, they reported, I think the Vilna Gon had still dew on his beard. I've heard that too. So there, there is the ability to elevate the body to where it doesn't have to go through that cleansing process when the soul is pulled away from it. If the body is used only as a vessel for the soul, then there's no reason for it to decompose. It's when it's used for its own sake that it needs to return to the earth. Rabbi, thank you so much. You saved me from my middle age crisis of identity. I think you gave me enough clarity and the listener's clarity on, on who we are, what defines us. That will help bring a lot more focus and passion, everything we do and working in our growth as Jews. So thank you so much. It was my pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.